few things tempt us more than conflict. Now, I grant you that conflict is nowhere near as enjoyable as chocolate or power or the attainment of wealth, I suppose. But if you think about it, few, few things draw us in as easily as a heated argument, a battle of the wills, or a good old us versus them narrative. Whether we are conflict averse or not, engaging in it head on or just safely from a distance, we get sucked into conflicts, giving them our focus and our energies even our sleep. Let's think for a moment. Bring to mind a conflict that you are currently engaged in. Now maybe it's with a family member who you cannot see eye to eye with on just about anything, but who you can't stop being baited by. Maybe it's with a politician that you don't even know, but who you debate in your head Sure that you are winning point by point. Maybe it's an institution or a movement to which you belong that you are philosophically or ethically at odds with, believing it in need of course correction. Or maybe it's a childhood friend that you're still connected with on Facebook whose posts make your blood boil, but who you continue to read and argue with, unable to hide these posts or just let them go. If you are in a conflict like this or another, raise your hand. Ugh, what good company we are in, friends. We are in very good company because, as Amanda suggested, we are human. And we are, as such, really susceptible to being lured in by the heat and the drama and the perceived high stakes of conflict. Author and journalist Amanda Ripley has spent the last several years investigating how good people with good intentions get captured by and then held in conflict. Now her research distinguishes between different types of course. There is productive, beneficial conflict, the sort that we all depend on to challenge and to change injustice and stagnation, producing growth and transformation for both people and systems. And then there's high conflict. High conflict, as Ripley defines it, is a mysterious force that incites people to lose their minds in ideological disputes, political feuds, or gang vendettas. This force that causes us to lie awake at night, obsessed by a conflict. It is what happens when conflict clarifies into a good versus evil kind of feud, the kind with an us and a them. In this state, each encounter with the other side, whether it's literal or virtual, becomes more charged. In the brain, it behaves differently. She writes that when we're trapped in this kind of unproductive and unhealthy conflict, we feel increasingly certain of our superiority and at the same time, more and more mystified by the other side. Now research confirms that both sides believe themselves to be reacting defensively. But they return to the feud over and over, itemizing indignities, tending to it like a fire. She gets the term high conflict from divorce litigation when in the 80s lawyers noticed that about a quarter of divorces were mired in this perpetual cycle of hostility and blame, going nowhere, causing greater and greater harm to all of the participants. And the people most hurt by this were the children. 
who would remain in relationship with both of these participants in this ongoing high-octane feud. And when we're in high conflict, we cannot or we will not remember that there are people being hurt because of it. And it's always the most vulnerable. In the case of our national politics, we can think about this in this way. If things get really, really reduced, boiled down, and reductive, we have two perceived sides, right? But no matter who is in power or who is winning at any given moment, we're still in this together. We still share the country, the children. We're stuck in relationship and community, whether we want to be or not. Now, from our faith perspective, we think of it slightly differently, but I would say with the same result. We're kin. We're bound to each other, a part of one another, full stop. So we might as well figure out how we can be in relationship beyond rupture, seeing as we are in this together for the long haul. We need a better way, even with the deep divides. I'm going to take us back. 2018, summer. Now, once a year, my family, my whole family, my sisters and their kids and spouses and my parents, we all get together on the Gulf Coast for a week. Now, as you recall, 2018 was a tumultuous time. It felt like we were fighting everywhere on all fronts. And I have to say that several of the movements that I was personally a part of at the time, it, well, it felt like we were just plain losing. We were, remember, as a church, in active and ongoing conflict with the denomination for its increased oppression of queer folks. And we were gearing up for this special general conflict, which would, conference, ha <laughs> ha. Oh, this says so much. God is so funny. All right, conference. <laughs> Bear with me. Which would take place that February? Y'all with me? Y'all remember this time? Because I clearly do. See how I just transported? Okay. Now, into that context, I, as a full-time and fully engaged activist and leader in the inclusive church movement, was desperately in need of a break. I was spiritually exhausted, and I was emotionally on the back foot. I knew that. Y'all know how that feels, right? So I needed to not be engaged in this same conflict. Well, one day, right, on that trip, I came in from the beach, and I showered, and I put on a new pair of shorts and a T-shirt. I joined the family in the kitchen, and I was going to make myself a sandwich. My dad and I happened to go for the pickle jar at exactly the same time. Now, I grabbed first, and he sort of smiled, noticing me. I carried on when I felt him sort of pull me towards him, and then I saw that he was squinting to read my shirt. It said, called out, queer clergy caucus. And then it had underneath all of the first names of out members printed below, mine among them. Huh, he said. Now, this is where I went wrong. <laughs> I could have predicted, just as sure as you can now, where this was going to go. And yet, a simple, short, vocalized breath, huh, snagged my full attention, my entire being. I think of how it feels when that happens. The complete and total transfer of all my awareness, all of my oomph to this conflict. And the best I can think is that it's kind of like when the dementors of the wizarding world of Harry Potter suck out the spirits of their targets. That's what it feels like. What followed was an argument that changed no one. But what is even more revealing is that it ended up hurting everyone. And to add insult to injury, 
we are on the same side of the larger fight. The argument was over this one stinking word, and I bet you can guess it, queer. Now, Dad thought that it was too provocative, too divisive to be attached to a movement that had aspirations of greater impact within a centrist to conservative denomination. You'll push them away, Leela Boo, he said. <laughs> you won't get anywhere with that label. Now, I remember hollering above this den, it's not for you. It's not about you. Now, we went through our conflicting perspectives of the successes and the failures of past social movements. Black power, women's rights, workers' rights, and on and on. It was classic high conflict I recognize now. <laughs> and here's how I know. It was unproductive, unhealthy, and damaging, and I lost myself to it. I know I did because I'm still arguing the case. Not with my dad, the last we spoke of it was on that day. But if I don't stop myself, I still amass debate points when they occur to me. The temptation to keep it going is that strong. Y'all know what I mean? Now this week, in Matthew's take on the temptation of Jesus, we see a different way to be in conflict, one that offers some guidance for navigating the things that rupture between us, a way that doesn't shy away from confrontation when necessary, but that does resist the lure of continual, relentless, and damaging high conflict. Now, I think it's important for us to remember right from the start what Matthew tells us. Jesus was tempted. It's what Mark tells us in his gospel and what Luke tells us too. Jesus was tempted, which means that we don't need to downplay the devil and the devil's purpose or power. And we also don't need to shortchange Jesus' resistance and choices. The devil is good at enticing and cajoling and capturing and enthralling all of us. Jesus, too. And here, we have a weakened and depleted Jesus. He is struggling. To a famished Jesus, the devil offers bread. To the Son of Man, the tempter offers possession of all kingdoms in the world. And when those fail, to the Son of God, Satan bargains for Jesus' own belief. Now to each offering, though tempted, Jesus does say no. But Jesus says no to more than these three enticements that we love to talk about. Jesus says no to this continuing battle of wills. He confronts, he rejects, he reestablishes himself, and like my older sister says, he finds his finish. <laughs> Jesus resists the temptation to keep at it with the devil, to be locked in an endless cycle of argument on that cliff's edge. He dismisses the devil, away with you, Satan. Jesus has a life to live. He has lessons to teach, healing to bring about, systems to overturn, friends to make, earthly power to disrupt, meals to cook and to eat, enemies to love, disciples to call, justice to create. He can't stay on that dang cliff edge out in the middle of nowhere, in the clutch of the devil, in an endless cycle of high conflict. No. He sees somehow beyond the conflict, beyond the rupture, even the one that is created within himself. Adrian Marie Brown, in the summer of 2020, began writing what she would later call in her book, We Will Not Cancel Us. Now, she wrote it as a lament for how canceled cult culture and its promotion of targeted vengeance had wreaked havoc on creative conflict and subsequent visioning and action 
within movement spaces. Now, she grieved and observed a loss in capacity and effectiveness in life-affirming, justice-building movements. Because conflicts and call-outs were becoming the sole focus. Not the work, not the change, not the hope. Punitive tendencies were taking root and they were flourishing. New ways of being and belonging were no longer the aim and the aspiration of these powerful collectives, the ones that we're all really depending on to break oppression and to give us all liberation. She wrote then, we are all together now, teetering on the edge of hopelessness. Collective burnout and other exhaustions have us spent and flailing, especially if we are caught in reactive loops instead of purposeful adaptations. Movements need to grow. They need to deepen. We need to transform ourselves in order to transform the world. We need the people within our movements, all socialized into and by unjust systems, to be on liberative paths, not already free, but practicing freedom every day. Not already beyond harm, but accountable for doing our individual and internal work to end harm, to end the cycles of harm and unprincipled struggle in ourselves and our communities. I've experienced these communal fractures in focus and in fortitude. I'm sure you have too. This obsession with continual conflict, it affects us personally, it affects us collectively, in intimate relationships and in community movements. Lent is as good a time as any to stop, to figure out how we contribute to perpetuating cycles of very harmful conflict and expanding the rupture. We can interrupt those cycles that we are really tempted into. Let's ask, what will we give ourselves to? What will be our aim and our aspiration? Where will we place our focus and our hope? How will we live and move and learn with a landscape that is rippled with ruptures? and tempting us to stay engaged in ongoing, unhealthy argument with evil. It's so hard to resist and to reject, even when we can identify the insidiously distracting and consuming tactic. So what do we do? Well, I look to Jesus. How does this experience of real, engaged, tempting conflict um, affect him? What does he do? Well, immediately after, and most instructively, I think, for us, he welcomes and receives the care of angels. Let's take that in. Jesus doesn't leave wilderness in the depleted state. He takes time to find repair for his mind and his body and his soul. And then, then Jesus leaves that place to go somewhere else to teach his first lesson. And do y'all know what that is? Well, let's clarify what it wasn't and could have been first. It so easily could have been a blasting, blaring, bullhorn message, diatribe to the crowds, right? It could have been something like, the devil is here! Right now, right this very minute, among you and offering you bread when you're hungry, using your sacred text, peddling get rich quick schemes and making you question your core beliefs. Right now, the devil is amassing an army of followers and they are gaining ground, rising in power and taking over. Jesus' lesson after this conflicting and challenging face-to-face -face with evil could have begun. The earth is the devil's domain and he rules it effectively with keen political and spiritual struggle. He's been busy winning souls for Satan. Find his followers. 
whether they are in your neighborhood or in your very home, and cast them out of our communities. They are not with us. They are not for you. They are as evil as the ones they follow. Jesus could have said all that and more could have spent an entire ministry soapboxing with Satan. In front of that crowd or another, Jesus could have gone on and on and on, arguing with the devil, whether he was there or not. But that's not what he did. What did he do? Matthew tells us he went to Galilee and he began proclaiming the message. Change your hearts and minds for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Ah, holy Jesus, what a way you show us. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, he tells the crowd. It's here with you, among you, inside of you. He doesn't give more fuel to the fire of conflict, staying stuck in the fight and in the systems of the status quo. He declares a new way, a radical repair, a total transformation, not evil will have its way. But heaven is here. Oh, and let's not forget that this doesn't mean that evil is not near or that the devil is not at work. But Jesus puts his prayers, his energy, his focus, his whole soul and body into the creation of something. The construction of justice, the building of good, the repair of the world and us. So let's follow that example. Let us give less of ourselves to conflict, perpetuating destructive divides and amplifying the ruptures among us. Instead, let us take the best of ourselves and our souls and use it to build and to forge and imagine and create the kingdom. Let's use our gifts and resources joined by angels and by community and direct our individual and collective oomph to the great and divine work of kingdom construction. Let's be a part of the repair. Change your hearts and minds, friends. The kingdom of heaven is at hand.